Hey guys, welcome to Learn Today IGCSE. This video is a tutorial on Chemistry Paper 2, Variant 2 from October-November 2023 examinations. Question 1 is from Chapter 1. Part of a cooling curve for water is shown. We can see here that it starts at a high temperature and then it reduces down until below zero. What is occurring between point X and Y? So from here until here. We can see that the temperature here is constant. If you see a graph with temperature reducing, it means that it's a cooling graph. So period X to Y is similar to this level. The process here is freezing. Option A, steam is condensing into water, is gas turning into liquid, which happens at this stage. The temperature of the water is decreasing. It's not, it remains constant at 0 degrees Celsius. Next, ice is melting. It's not melting. This is a process of solid turning into liquid, which happens for a heating curve. And lastly, particles are losing heat to the surrounding. This is correct because during the process of freezing, the particles will lose heat to make bonds. So the answer here is D. Question 2 onwards is from chapter 2. Which statements about clean dry air are correct? This here is the composition of air. Number 1 says that it is a mixture of elements only. This is not correct because 0.04% of dry air is made up of carbon dioxide which is not an element but a compound. So we can cancel any option that contain number 1. Number 2 says that it is a mixture of elements and compounds. This is correct. Number 3 says that it contains only non-metals. Argon here is non-metal, carbon dioxide as well. Oxygen, nitrogen is also non-metal. So option 3 is correct giving us an answer of C. Next, question 3. A representation of an atom is shown. What is the nuclear number of this atom? Nuclear number is the total number of proton plus the neutron in the nucleus of an atom. So the center here is the nucleus of the atom. Protons are positively charged and neutron here has no charge, meaning that the gray particles will be the neutron. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 neutrons and you will add up with the number of protons present in the nucleus which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Adding up together will give us 13. So the answer here is D. Question 4. The percentage abundances of three isotopes in a sample of neon are shown. Isotopes are elements that have the same proton number but a different nuclear number. What is the relative atomic mass of this sample of neon? When you are asked to look for relative atomic mass, given the percentage abundance, you can do it by a simple calculation, whereby you will take the percentage abundance and multiply it by its nuclear number, add them all up together and divide it by 100. Just put these values in your calculator and you will get 20.19. So the answer is B. Next, question 5. Potassium reacts with iodine to form potassium iodide. Potassium will be written as K, iodine is from group 17 and they present as a diatomic molecule so don't forget to write 2 over here and they will form potassium iodide. The charge of potassium is plus 1 and the charge of iodine is minus 1. To get their formula, we will use their charge and cross them out to get the molecular formula. So the molecular formula is Ki. Now if we were to balance it, there is a 2 for iodine so I'm going to put a 2 here making 2 potassium and balance it with another 2 here. Next, which statement about potassium iodide is correct? Option A says that each potassium atom shares a pair of electrons. This is wrong because potassium is a metal and iodine is a non-metal, making this an ionic bond. An ionic bond donates an electron and gains the electron to become stable. Option B, in potassium iodide, the particles of potassium have more protons than electrons. So in potassium iodide, the particles of potassium has donated one electron. Potassium atom has 19 electrons and 19 protons. But after donating one electron, it is left with 18 electrons and the proton remains the same. So yes, this statement is correct. The answer is B. Question C. Which substance has the lowest melting point? There are two types of compound that you will learn. The first one is an ionic compound and the second is a covalent compound. Ionic compound has high melting point and boiling point. In covalent compound, you have a simple covalent compound or a giant covalent compound. A simple covalent compound has a low melting point and boiling point whereas a giant covalent compound has high melting point and boiling point. So the lowest melting point will be a simple covalent compound and a simple covalent compound is methanol. Question 7. Question 7 onwards is from chapter 3, stoichiometry. 
The diagram shows the structure of a molecule of ethyl ethanoate. What is the molecular formula of a molecule of ethyl ethanoate? The molecular formula tells you the actual number of atoms of each element in one molecule of the compound. So as we can see here, there are four C's, eight hydrogens, and two oxygens. So the answer is B. Question 8. A hydrocarbon contains 85.7% of carbon by mass. What is the empirical formula of the hydrocarbon? Hydrocarbon only consists of carbon and hydrogen. So the rest of 14.3% is of hydrogen. To find the empirical formula, we can do it by the box method. So we are first going to label it with the elements that are present, which is carbon and hydrogen. For the first row, we are going to fill it up with the percentage. The total here must be equal to 100. Next, we are going to find the mole for each of these elements. Mole can be calculated by mass over molar mass. The percentage here will be our mass. So 85.7 and the molar mass for carbon can be obtained by the periodic table, which is 12. So divided by 12 giving us 7.14. And next, we are going to repeat the same step for hydrogen. After obtaining the mole, we are going to get the ratio of the elements. And we can do that by taking the mole of each element and dividing it with the smallest number of mole. Comparing 7.14 to 14.3, 7.14 is a smaller number of mole. So we are going to divide all of this with 7.14. This will give us 1 and 2. So the empirical formula is C1 and H2. So the answer is A, CH2. Question 9. The formula of a compound containing element X is Na2X2O3. The relative formula mass of the compound is 158. This means that the mass of two sodiums adding up with 2X and 3 oxygen is going to give us 158. We are asked to find the relative atomic mass of element X. This is pretty simple. The mass of sodium is 23 and the mass of oxygen is 16. So we'll just substitute that into this equation. And simplifying this will give us something like this. So 46 plus 2 of x plus 48 is 158. Let's rearrange this and you'll get 2x equals to 64 giving us x32. So the answer is A. Next, question 10 onwards is from chapter 4 electrochemistry. Dilute aqueous potassium chloride is electrolyzed using platinum electrodes. Which row identifies the product at each electrode? The electrode that is attached to the positive terminal is your anode. And the terminal that is attached to the negative electrode is your cathode. To identify the product, we first must understand what ions are present in the electrolyte. So aqueous means that there is H plus and OH minus ions. Potassium chloride, so there is K plus and Cl- ions. The negatively charged ions will be attracted to the positively charged electrode which is the anode. And the positively charged ions will be attracted to the negatively charged electrode which is the cathode. According to the electrochemical series of cations and anions, between the two ions that are attracted to anode and cathode, we are going to pick the ions which is at the bottom of the list between H plus and potassium. H plus is at the bottom so it's easier to get discharged and for the negatively charged ions, hydroxide ion is at the bottom so hydroxide will get selectively discharged. Since electron move from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, the cathode here will receive electrons to become hydrogen gas and for anode, it will donate electron and the product is oxygen gas. So the answer here is C. Next, question 11. Concentrated aqueous copper chloride is electrolyzed using copper electrodes as shown. What happens to the mass of each electrode during this process? So we are going to repeat the same thing. The first step is to identify the ions in the electrolyte. Aqueous means that there is H plus and OH minus ion. Copper 2, so it is copper 2 plus and chloride ion is Cl minus. Step 2 is to identify which ion goes to anode which is the positive terminal and cathode which is at the negative terminal. So since anode is positively charged, it will attract the negatively charged ions. And since cathode is negatively charged, it will attract the positively charged ions. And step 3, we are going to choose the ions that get discharged because there are two that is attracted and we only have to pick one. Pay attention that they are using a copper electrode which is not inert. So we're going to repeat the same step between H plus and Cu plus. 
H and Cu, we're going to pick the one which is the least reactive at the bottom. So at cathode, Cu2 plus will be chosen. Whereas at anode, none will be chosen because copper electrodes is used. So the copper electrode at anode will oxidize itself to form Cu2 plus plus 2E. Oxidize meaning that this copper electrode will start to corrode and become thinner. Whereas at cathode, since the movement of electron is from positive to negative, it will gain electron to form copper. So copper will be deposited around this electrode over here. So the negative electrode will get thicker due to the deposition of copper. So its mass will increase. Whereas at the positive electrode, which is anode, the copper has oxidized, causing it to get thinner and corroded. So its mass would decrease. The answer is B. Next, question 12 onwards is from chapter 5. The initial and final temperature of four different reactions are measured. Which reaction is the least exothermic? Exothermic is a process of losing heat to the surroundings. So now let's look at the initial temperature and the final temperature differences. For these two reactions, the temperature has decreased, therefore they must be an endothermic reaction. We want to find the least exothermic, so we are going to look at a smaller increase of temperature, which is option D. So the answer here is D. Next, question 13. Which equation represents endothermic reaction? Endothermic reaction is when energy is absorbed to break bonds so that it can form new bonds. So out of these four equations, chlorine gas which is previously attached to each other was broken to form two separate CLs. So the answer is A. Question 14. Methane burns in oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. The bond energies are shown. What is the energy change for this reaction? To find the energy change, we're going to have to calculate it by calculating the energy intake minus the energy given out. So the energy taken in will be the energy from the reactants. So to do this, I'll first draw out all the bonds present in your reactants. And you have got 1, 2, 3 and 4 CH bonds and 2 of oxygen bonds. So the CH bond will be multiplied by 4 and adding up with the oxygen bonds multiplied by 2. And next, we're going to find the energy out which is at the products. We'll repeat the same step by drawing out the bonds. You have got 1 CO and 2 CO. You have got 2 CO bonds and you have got 1 and 2 OH. But there are 2 of these, so 2 times 2 giving us a total of 4 OH bonds. So we're going to multiply the carbon oxygen atom by 2 and OH bond by 4. We can put all this value in our calculator and we will get a value of negative 818. The negative here represents that this reaction is an exothermic reaction. So the answer here is A. Question 15 onwards is from chapter 6. Hydrochloric acid is added to excess calcium carbonate in two separate experiments. I'm going to first write down the chemical equation for this reaction. Since this is a reaction with carbonate, we will get carbon dioxide and water. To measure the rate of this reaction, we are going to collect the volume of carbon dioxide being produced. The higher the volume, the higher the rate of reaction. Two different concentrations of hydrochloric acid are used, but the temperature is the same in both experiments. This is to ensure a fair test. Which rule is correct? So as we can see here, the higher concentration has achieved a higher volume of carbon dioxide, whereas the lower concentration of hydrochloric acid achieved a lower volume of carbon dioxide. As mentioned, higher volume means higher rate of reaction. So a higher concentration means that the rate of reaction is higher. According to the kinetic theory of particles, when the concentration is high, it means that the molecules per unit volume is also high. This causes the collision rate to increase. So the option is between A and B. Now there will be no change of collision energy because to increase or decrease collision energy, we're going to have to use a catalyst. And there is no catalyst being used in this reaction, so the answer is B. Next, the decomposition of dinitrogen tetroxide into nitrogen dioxide is a reversible reaction. The equation for this reaction is shown. The forward reaction is endothermic, which row shows the effect on the position of equilibrium and the rate of reverse reaction when the temperature is increased. 
Le Chatelier's principle states that if the conditions of a system in an equilibrium change, then the system will respond by opposing the change. So the position of the equilibrium can either shift to the right or to the left. When the temperature is increased, the equilibrium will shift to oppose this by trying to reduce the temperature. So how does it reduce the temperature? It does this by favoring the endothermic reaction which takes the extra energy in and cools the reaction mixture down. So the forward reaction here is endothermic. This is the forward reaction. So this means that equilibrium will shift to the right. So the position of equilibrium shifts to the right. Now we're going to look for the rate of reverse reaction. So this is the reverse reaction. Rate meaning the speed of the reaction. When the equilibrium shifted to the right, it increases the product form. That means that the concentration of NO2 is now increased. According to rate of reaction, when concentration is increased, the rate of reaction will also increase. So the answer here is D. Question 17. In a blast furnace, iron oxide is converted to iron and carbon monoxide is converted to carbon dioxide. What happens to each of these reactions? You are being tested on your knowledge of redox. A redox reaction is the process of reduction and oxidation taking place at the same time. If you're struggling to remember what is reduction and oxidation, in terms of electron transfer, you can think of oil rig. Oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons. Whereas in terms of oxygen, reduction means the number of oxygen atoms has decreased, whereas oxidation means it has gained oxygen atoms, so the number of oxygen atoms will now increase. And as for the oxidation number, for reduction, the oxidation number decreases and for oxidation, the oxidation number increases. So I've simplified it in this table. I hope you will memorize them. The correct statement will be from option D because iron oxide is reduced. Iron oxide becomes iron as it has lost the oxygen atom and carbon monoxide is oxidized. The carbon monoxide has become carbon dioxide gaining an extra oxygen. So more oxygen means oxidation. Hence the answer is D. Question 18. Which row describes what happens to Fe2 plus ion when they are oxidized? In terms of electron movement, you can remember oil rig whereby oxidation is the loss of electrons. And as for the oxidation number, in oxidation, the oxidation number will increase. So the answer here is D. Question 19 onwards is from chapter 7. In which reaction does an acid react with a base? An acid is a proton donor. It will contain H plus and the base will contain OH minus. So we're going to look at our options. And only this equation has a proton donor H plus and hydroxide ion. So the answer is D. Next, question 20. Which element forms an oxide that reacts with an aqueous solution of a base? So this here has to be something acidic and this will be base, which is alkali. So something acid would be sulfur as the property of sulfur dioxide is acidic. Question 21. Which method is used to produce insoluble salts? To produce an insoluble salt, we will first react two soluble salts together and then get one insoluble salt and another soluble salt. So that would be the precipitation of using two aqueous solution. The answer is C. 